Welcome to the continuing discussion of types of structural action from section 6 of chapter 1. Uh, we've been talking about primarily axial tension, axial compression, and bending, but also torsion as the primary modes of structural action. And so far, the focus of our discussion has been on tension action. In a previous video, we talked about cross bracing as examples of members that are working predominantly in tension. And now we're going to focus on the issue of connections and adjustment mechanisms. In the previous video, we examined a simple structure like this. This is a rigid frame, which is very strong against forces parallel to the plane of the frame, but very weak for forces uh, perpendicular, like parallel to these purlins. So what we said was, uh, since we don't have any gravity loads, uh, we're only resisting wind loads, um, we can put in these cross bracing elements and it's quite dramatic, the contrast between the weight of this cross bracing and the weight of the rigid frame. We do need to remember that the rigid frame is being asked to span a substantial distance under gravity load and resist wind loads parallel to the frame of the, to the plane of the frame. So it has a much greater challenge, but it's quite stunning how lightweight these tension members can be. Uh, in the particular case of this system, we pointed out that at the base, um, there's a screw adjustment or a threaded end to the, uh, to the tension member or the cross brace member. There's a nut that gets run up on it. And in that manner, we can accomplish two things. We can adjust the structure to make sure that these elements are truly vertical, where they're supposed to be vertical. And second of all, we can introduce some tension into the members uh, to avoid excessive movement. If we have really slack cross bracing members as the wind shifts, the structure can move substantially. And if the movement is too great, parts of the structure will begin to play the role that the cross bracing is supposed to play. So we need to introduce some tension in those members. We need to be careful because if we put too much tension in them, we can do damage to the frame. So for example, we might pull on this base and, and move or shift the foundation point, or we might crush this member or one of these verticals in compression. We also have other issues that we need to be concerned about in certain types of structures. And this is an example of a structure that is very complex, which means it has a geometry where every time we tension one of these rods, the stresses ricochet through the rest of the structure and alter how it's behaving. So you may need somebody with extraordinary understanding of the structure to do the adjustment of all the rods in this case. In this case, though, there's also another factor of extreme importance. When wind load shifts in direction abruptly, tension members that were slack suddenly go into tension. And that yanking effect produces a, a very dramatic sound called rod banging. And this happens to be a, a church, and it's not the kind of environment that you can afford to have rod banging. So the people who designed this building had to give a great deal of thought to that issue. And in fact, during the design process, they were extensively challenged on that point by people who were investing in this church and wanted to make sure that it was going to function correctly. This is the Cathedral of Christ the Light in Oakland, California. It was designed by the uh, San Francisco office of Skidmore, Mer Merrill, Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. And the architectural designer was Craig Hartman and the engineer was Mark Sarkeesian. And this is absolutely one of the most exquisite buildings from a point of view of spatial quality, uh, light quality, and just brilliant structural engineering. Uh, the basic structural concept and spatial concept is the following. There is a curved, uh, not exactly a surface, it's a series of louvers and glue lamb elements that define the interior space. The exterior surface is a portion of a cylinder, or excuse me, a, 
a cone and um, the, there's a conical element on the other side. Those two cones are not part of the same cone though. It's more like they're pieces of that surface that have gotten cut away and then moved in closer together. The key thing is there are glue lamb, straight glue lamb elements in the boundary. There are curved glue lamb elements on the inside. The exterior portion of the structure is connected to the interior through a series of struts which essentially run radially to these curved elements. And then all the lateral stabilization inside that volume is achieved using cross bracing in a three-dimensional pattern. So it's a classic example of what I mentioned that you can you can have a situation where uh, adjusting the tension in any given one of those tension rods might cause uh, ricochet effects throughout the entire structure. This was a, a rendering during the design phase of this project. Uh, this shows the geometry. The interior volume is defined by portions of two spheres which are offset from each other but which intersect which produces this general shape and then the top part of that is cut away and slices on each end are cut away to create these openings and one of these openings becomes a, a major part of the entry and the other is the backdrop uh, for um, for the altar. Now you see in this diagram those portions of a sphere on the inside and then these portions of a cone on the outside with a space in between and then those things are laced together with a series of radial compression struts and then a whole series of cross bracing elements going in a variety of directions. This is a photograph of the actual structure after it was completed where you see the exterior uh, conical surfaces, the interior uh, surfaces that are a portion of a sphere. And you can kind of see those things laced together but not too well because if you look in this diagram the rods are extremely delicate um, but they're the absolute crucial part of maintaining the integrity of this building. It's an absolutely beautiful structure. This is the entry. This is coming through that broad entry where there's a kind of compression and then it begins to open up on the inside. And this is viewing towards the altar. And then lifting upward, we see this view of the ceiling. Um, and I can't help but stop here a moment and say that these louvers led through a pattern of light, which is apparent here. It's dappled light. It's very irregular, um, but it's also very mellow because there is fritted glass on the outside and that causes some diffusion. So instead of really bright spots and then relatively dark spots, we have a pattern of light and dark, which is energizing and enjoyable but never a cause of glare. So not only spatially did this project ex ad absolutely hit the target from, but from a daylighting point of view it did also. And when I sat in this space I sat in one place long enough and just waited for one of these spots of light to find me and I didn't find it distracting or a source of glare and actually it was almost like a religious experience to kind of have this light that seemed to be just devoted to me uh, but it was never a source of glare or any kind of discomfort. Um, note this very heavy wall that's very very thick and then has been carved away. This portion of the structure is concrete. Everything from here up is glue lamb wood which is very warm and provides very mellow kind of light. Uh, and then of course there's the steel struts and steel cross brace elements internal to the volume which is just outside of this uh, slatted structure that you see here. Um, this lower structure out of concrete has a very monolithic and powerful quality to it. What's absolutely amazing about this building though is that everything is floated on ground base isolators. So in fact the earth underneath this in Oakland, California which is a major seismic zone can move back and forth 
and this structure will stay more or less in place, including this massive concrete wall, which appears to be rooted to the ground, but actually is not. Okay, so coming back, uh, we, we kind of hit the topic of adjustability in the uh, Cathedral of Christ the Light. Uh, in this case, we'll talk uh, for a few moments about how you make a connection that you can rely on. Uh, this rod comes down, it's threaded on the end, as we've discussed, and that thread looks something like this. Now the one problem with doing this is if you just take a rod and you thread it, you cut away almost half of the material. And then when you account for stress risers associated with the uh, sharp uh, cuts into the material, you've actually lost about half the capacity of the rod. And typically we would like to not have this little connection control the strength of that because in a way we're throwing away all that material by making the rod uh, twice as large in cross section as it needs to be but we also have all that weight that's causing sag in the rods and that influences how much tension we have to put in them and so forth so we would ideally like to create some kind of a connection that doesn't undermine the strength and this shows one way that that can be done here we have a rod that has been clamped inside of a, a volume where uh, the material can be heated up and then rammed with a, uh, an element that basically forges the material. So it crushes the material at the end. This material is held in a friction clamp so it can't uh, change its shape that much. But this material, as it compresses downward, it spreads outward and that in turn makes the rod effectively thicker near the ends. And this, uh, this treatment is sometimes called a double butted rod. And in bicycles, for example, the advent of double butted spokes was a huge advance in the uh, efficiency of bicycles because we were able to use smaller spokes and have greater strength from them. So this is actually a testing sample to test material failure this gets screwed into uh, one end of the test device, this into the other, and tension is applied until a failure occurs like this. Because of the way this is designed, the failure always occurs in the rod part and not in the thread part, and that's good because if it failed in the thread portion, it would damage the testing machine. This same concept is applied in a somewhat less dramatic way in the typical tension rod that's bought for buildings. This may be a little difficult to see here, but the, the diameter of the rod in this zone is less than the diameter of the threads there. And this was achieved uh, by this forging process that we just mentioned. And you'll notice the threads have been run all the way up here, and they're beginning to sort of peter out here because, in fact, the rod diameter is diminishing to the point that that thread can be run up on this portion of the rod and it doesn't have any effect because the rod is small enough in diameter there that there's no cutting action that occurs. So this is an example of how we managed to make a simple threaded connection develop the full strength of the rod. Okay, so here's another example of a tension member. This building is being carried on this arch to keep the arch from splaying off to the sides, there needs to be a tension member across the bottom. Because steel is so incredibly efficient, that tension member is barely visible in this drawing, but if we go in this photograph, but if we go to the end, we'll see that that tension member consists of four of these steel bars or slabs of steel uh, that have a vertical dimension uh, equal to this movement of the arrow and one of these goes on each side of these plates which are welded into uh, this base piece. You'll notice that if we drill a hole to put a, um, a rod through here uh, to handle the shear, um, if we drill that hole in this member we would cut away a substantial part of the cross section and there would be an, a tendency to shear or to tear through the material rather on each side of that hole. So we'd have two effects of, of damaging our, our tension member, one of which is we'd be reducing the cross section, but second of all we'd be producing stress risers and so it would be dramatically weakened. So rather than allow that to happen, which would force us to drastically oversize uh, these bars,
uh, the bars have been widened out at the end so that the amount of material that has to be torn through here is equal to whatever that material would be there. So this is a very elegant uh, effect that we call these eye bars and for a very long time in bridge construction and, and in many buildings they were a common way of dealing with tension members. Here's another method. This is the brute force friction method. Here we have a cable which has come down, it's been looped around back onto itself, and then it's been clamped repeatedly with clamps. So this is a friction connector connection. It comes very close to developing the full strength of the member, but it's sort of brute force and crude. And you'll notice in this case, this is the connection. And in, in the previous ex example that we used on basically this structure, the, the connection member method was also the adjustment method. In the case of this structure, this is the connection method, and then the adjustment is in the form of these turnbuckles. Turnbuckles have a left-handed and right-handed thread. One end is left-handed, the other hand is right-handed. So as we rotate this turnbuckle, it climbs up on the threads here and climbs down on the threads at that end and in the end pulls everything together. So if that were just a regular union with everything being right-handed threads, when we turned the turnbuckle it would just climb up and down but it wouldn't adjust the overall length of the structural element and wouldn't adjust the tension. Here's another example of a friction connection. In this previous diagram all this friction that's developed by these clamps is what keeps this uh, cable from sliding out and failing. In this case, we have a tendency for these suspenders to want to slide down this cable, and we have these clamping mechanisms, which basically are wrapped around this primary suspension element, and then they're bolted around it to the point that they develop a very high level of friction, so that under the vertical force, of these uh, vertical suspenders, these connectors don't slide down the suspension element. This is a method we use at this scale and at even larger scale. And I might mention one of the things we haven't talked about with high strength steel is you can't drill it because it's too hard, but also you create too much stress risers and you can't weld it because you will detemper it when you do that. So the connection method me methods are basically you either glue something to it or you use friction. This is an example of a friction connection. This is a friction connection at a larger scale. So this is the from the Golden Gate Bridge and this connector really needs some attention at this point. But all these bolts were used to clamp it around the primary suspension element. Which by the way looks very smooth here because the casing has been put around it. But there are literally thousands of strands of high strength steel in there and the overall dimension of this is about 37 inches or in other words about one meter but in this case what keeps these suspenders from pulling this down the slope surface is the friction that's developed by clamping this clamp around by tightening up these bolts now here's an example of gluing um, these are steel cables that have been pre-stressed with a hydraulic device and then uh, friction um, elements or, or actually conical wedges have been driven in to create friction on these devices. So literally this cable cannot pull back through because as it does it pulls a conical shape element that jams itself into a conical shaped receptacle and the harder the force pulls on it, the greater the friction that's generated. Um, this cable goes out the other side. The cable is currently under a high tension of about 160,000 pounds per square inch of stress. And concrete will get poured. And this is the type of precast element that's going to come out of this called a double T. And once the concrete has cured around these cables, there's a lot of interface between the concrete and the cable. So even though the concrete is nowhere near as strong as this steel, because the bonding surface is quite large, the concrete will be able to hold it. 
So once the concrete is poured, then these uh, wedge elements can be hammered out of place and then these uh, steel cables can be cut back um, right to the face of the concrete piece. So this is an example of gluing where in this case the bond is between the concrete and the high strength steel cable. Here's another example of a kind of gluing. Uh, here we have a high strength steel cable it runs into this element which may be forged or cast if it's made out of steel which it typically will be. Inside of this steel element there's a conical volume. The strands, first the cable gets pushed through then the strands get unraveled and spread out through that volume and then the volume gets filled with a brazing metal and the characteristic of that metal is it's got to be strong enough to bond to the surface of this sufficiently that it can hold all those strands and it has to be a low enough temperature uh, for its melting point that it doesn't detemper the steel. This is called a clevis where this element splits into two pieces so it can go around a single plate and keep a nice symmetric load transfer. But in the connection here, the connection is through that gluing process and of course once that metal, that brazing metal, has hardened it's a conical shape and as this cable tries to pull back out, that cone jams even further in and creates more pressure and a better bond against the steel strands. Here's another example of that same phenomenon. This is the, uh, uh, the uh, Virginia Beach Convention Center designed by the Chicago office of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill. Basically there's a uh, a type of lenticular cable truss it's called. There are a bunch of different names for it but it has a compression member down the middle. It has tension cables on each side that get counter tensioned. This is what that looks like in place. This is what it looks like during uh, after fabrication just before shipping and this is a close-up. These cables come in, the strands are spread, the brazing metal is is cast in there uh, so this kind of conical shape reflects that interior conical metal piece and all this uh, threaded rod then allows the adjustment of this to get it properly tensioned and to the proper shape. And again you see here clevises in this case coming on each side of this plate. So the clevis would be put around it, the, the rod inserted, and then post-tension adjustments would be made after that. Here's another example of the same phenomenon. Uh, here we have a very large cable coming in. It's splayed outward into a conical volume inside of this uh, steel element. Um, the brazing metal is cast in there which grabs hold of the uh, tensile steel and now we have this U-bolt which uh, I didn't get close enough to measure it, but it looked to me like these are about four inch diameter rods. So these are like huge nuts that have to be used to do the tensioning in this cable. This is a lesser cable. You'll notice it has a more conventional kind of turnbuckle in it because it has a lesser load. Now, it's very difficult to model tension members. There are a couple of things I would say for students who are thinking about doing a design in this. The first is that tensile structures tend to have a mind of their own. They have a certain kind of shape that they can fit well. Um, it's a kind of shape that's very hard to create enclosure generally. So typically the most successful uses of things like fabric and cable structures is for uh, canopies and, and structures through which we're perfectly happy to have the wind blow so they're primarily shading devices and keep the rain off. There are exceptions. There are some fabulous buildings like the Denver Airport by Fentress Architects which is a truly iconic fabric structure and I don't discourage you from doing that but you will discover when you go to, to study that building that they had to, to have some very clever ideas for how they uh, made the interface for example between the glass walls which are brittle and don't tolerate much movement and the fabric roof which inherently has to move quite a bit in order to develop its full strength. This shape issue will become more apparent as we 
continue our discussions down the way related to tensile structures. Uh, for one thing, there are major issues having to do with how you resist forces in multiple directions. For example, you may have gravity loads downward, but you may have wind suction upward, and you basically need two structural systems in order to deal with those two directions of force because when you have force reversal, you create what would be compression in the tension members, which immediately buckle, so they're not capable of carrying that. So that's all in way of a warning, but I'm gonna make a few suggestions about some things that you can do with um, models of this sort. Um, here we have a compression strut up the middle, a compression ring around the boundary, we have a series of curved elements like this, and then curved elements that are circumferential. So we have radial and circumferential uh, elements. You'll notice in this case, the compression ring is being held by, down by a series of screws. Now, here's a really cool modeling technique in tensile structures. You know that if you have these concentric rings and you just put them around there and you start to tighten them up, they will just slide up. So we talked about friction connection, connections as a way of dealing with this, for example, in the Golden Gate Bridge to keep the suspenders from sliding down the suspension elements. A cool trick you can play is if you can get braided twine. This is not twisted twine. If you try to do this with twisted Twine, it'll just frustrate you because it simply won't work. But if you get braided, you can sew the, the uh, same material in the opposite direction through these elements. And by the nature of the braided elements, they will simply not allow that movement to occur in the tangential direction. Usually when we do this in models, by the way, these, element, these elements are a lighter form of twine but somehow this student managed to sew these elements through the uh, radial elements uh, in spite of the fact that they all came from the same spool of material. Another really crucial thing that this student did is by introducing these screws, he, it allowed him after he'd gotten everything put together to run these screws down uh, to pull the compression ring down and introduce a fairly drastically enhanced tension in this cable. So when you put your hand on this cable, it really felt like a structural system, which it would not have otherwise. Another comment I'll make is that in, in architecture, uh, either and in engineering, having to do with bridges and things of that sort, our primary tension material is steel. It's very stiff. It's very strong. Um, comparable materials are carbon fiber, but that's much more expensive and some bridges will be made out of uh, glass fiber, but generally steel is the material of choice almost anywhere that you don't have uh, salt environments where corrosion is a crucial issue. And even there, we've built most of our great bridges out of steel cable, even when they're in marine environments. Um, but steel is very stiff. Most of the materials that we use in tension for models like string is can be elongated very substantially. Uh, the material itself is inherently more stretchy, but also by the nature of the braiding or the or the uh, twisting of the material, it's a little loose, and as soon as you apply some load to it, it moves a lot. So it's very rare that you see a really good architectural model that uses string as the rendering material. The best way to do it, if you can figure out a way to make the, the connections, is to use steel wire for your modeling technique. But again, the issue of how you make the connections at the end is really a challenging one at the scale that we typically build models out of. Uh, just as a point here, the student pulled the compression ring down with these screws, and you may even notice there's a warping of the wood here because this compression member is pushing down in the center. These screws are pulling up and over time, uh, there's been a fair amount of deformation in the plywood base, which, by the way, raises interesting questions about what the footing of this would be. This is a typical deal that we create these really elegant, lightweight tensile structures, but then we need massive amounts of material underground, 
in order to make it work. So you shouldn't be deceived when you see these super lightweight things. They still have a major uh, compression component somewhere or bending component somewhere, and they're nowhere near as economical or as delicate as they look. Furthermore, they're complicated to pattern. They tend to be made out of very expensive materials. The people who make them are very high skilled people. But on top of that, they usually have huge numbers of adjustable elements, some of which are made out of things like marine grade stainless steel. So when you look at them, don't be deceived that they're somehow very cheap or minimally uh, requiring materials. They can be pretty expensive and pretty material intensive when you look at the overall structure. Now, one thing I will say is this student could have created an adjustment mechanism on this post and then the screws or whatever this hold down is would not have to be adjusted. And there, we actually do this in real buildings. This is the African Pavilion at the North Carolina State Zoo in Asheboro, North Carolina. And if you go visit this building, this huge spar down at the base of it, I don't have a picture that you can really see because it's so dark under all the vegetation down at the base, but there is an adjustment mechanism with eight foot long uh, rods, threaded rods, that actually allowed them to jack this tower up about six feet uh, in order to properly post tension at once the entire uh, fabric structure and the associated cables were in place. By the way, this is a very strong cusp line. There's steel cable in that, but everywhere else where it's just fabric, you see sort of smooth variations in the curvature. Now, sometimes we build little models like the one I showed you earlier with the yellow twine. Uh, sometimes in architecture school, we build sort of intermediate models. Um, at this scale, there are some adjustment techniques that you can use that are pretty straightforward. Um, this is a nifty little thing where they just took some sticks of wood and drilled holes in them. And basically, uh, this loops down around some sort of uh, eye bolt or support point at the bottom. And by pulling on this cable, you can tension it and slide this element up. And then when it snaps back, this odd angle here creates enough friction to hold it in place. There are also, by the way, knots that you can do. And years ago, after great pain, I learned how to do one of those knots. I've since forgotten how to do it because they are very complex. But if you're really into knots, you can, you can get a knot that will slide up, but not back down. Here are some other things. Uh, this is a, an example of a kind of turnbuckle. Here we have on one end an eye bolt, here an open hook on the other end. One of these is a right-handed thread, one of them is a left-handed thread. So this element, which by the way you'll notice has a hexagonal shape to it, that element uh, can be cranked with a bolt, with a, a, a wrench, to make an adjustment. You can get these in very small sizes if you're doing really small models but you'll have to look around for where you find them. And then of course, something like this, this is an eye bolt around which you can wrap the, uh, the cord or whatever you're using for your tensile elements in your model. And if this goes down through a base, you can then use the nut to make the adjustment. Most people don't go to this much trouble and they end up with really bad models. Okay, that ends our discussion of connections and adjustment mechanisms. This discussion has been really brief, just kind of hitting the highlights. Uh, for those of you who want to know more about tensile structures, uh, Chapter 9 is an extremely extensive discussion of the various kinds of shapes that are involved, and we will mention a few of those uh, in subsequent videos associated with Chapter 1.